Okay, uh, I'll start out by apologizing in advance because I'm not a preacher. <clears throat> um, so I don't speak a whole lot in, in a monologue type fashion. I'm used to dialogue, and so this is, a, this is different for me. Uh, we're going to look at Nehemiah, though, and it's really, it's really a neat book to, to look at, and we're gonna, I'm going to try to fly through this. Um, we're going to watch a video here in just a minute. Um, Nehemiah, let's just read from, if we look at uh, Nehemiah chapter 6 and verses 15 through 16, it says, so the wall was, was finished on the 25th day of the month Elul in 52 days. And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of the Lord, of our God. Okay, so Nehemiah, what he does that in this book that is quite, uh, quite impressive is he does, and he gathers together the people, and he, and he invigorates them and leads the charge to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem in 52 days. And it's quite a feat, uh, considering that that, um, that that had not been done for years and years and years, hundred, over 100 years. Uh, it, they had tried to do it, and it had been destroyed again. And we're going to see that. So this is quite an accomplishment that Nehemiah does. But um, even more than that, we're going to see that the greater feat was the, the uh, moral reform that comes after that, uh, <clears throat> that he does in Jerusalem. Nehemiah, just so we can kind of get a context, is a contemporary. That means he lives at the same time and works at the same time in Jerusalem as Ezra. Okay, Ezra, uh, if you'll remember, is um, more dealing with uh, spiritual reform in Jerusalem. Um, whereas Nehemiah is now working on actual geographical, structural reform to begin with, and then moral reform later on. Um, Nehemiah is a cupbearer. At the time, he's a cupbearer for the king in, uh, in Persia. His name was Artaxerxes I, and he succeeded, uh, succeeded his dad Darius, um, which I started kind of reading about that. Um, Darius was assassinated by Artaxerxes' brother, I believe, his older brother, and Artaxerxes took the throne and immediately killed their, um, his brother. It's kind of weird, uh, those, those, the way those kings and, and sons worked. Um, but Artaxerxes had some, some level of success in his rule because he took all of his father Darius's rules and basically just kept those in place. He didn't try to change anything. And so uh, where he was did experience some, some amount of uh, success. Okay, so, so Nehemiah is the cupbearer for Artaxerxes. And what that means is that he would take the wine if he, or whatever he was going to drink, and he would drink some of it before giving that to the king to make sure that it wasn't poisoned. And so he was very trusted uh, in the palace. Okay, so um, he, he's granted permission by Artaxerxes to go back home to Jerusalem. When he gets there, he challenges his countrymen to arise and rebuild the walls um, they experience, as we'll see, opposition from without, so outside of their, the people that are working, and from within uh, their own group. And in spite of this opposition from without and within, uh, the task is completed in only 52 days. And we, as we saw in those two verses just now, the only thing that they could do, the enemies just say, well, this, is, this had to be from God. <laughs> uh, that was the, the uh, conclusion. So, um, in contrast, as we already said, the task of, of reviving the, the walls is, is um, not nearly as hard as reviving the people and reforming the people in, in their, their, uh, the, what they're doing, the moral side of things. Okay, so at this point, we're going to, let's go ahead and watch the video, Michelle, and then we will jump into a little deeper, hear what goes on. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah. 
In most modern Bibles, these books are separate, but that division happened long after it was written. It was originally a unified work written by a single author. The story is set after the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and its temple and took many of the people into exile. And this book picks up about 50 years later and tells the return of some Israelites to Jerusalem and then what happened when they rebuilt the city and their lives there. Specifically, the book focuses on three key leaders who led the rebuilding efforts. You have Zerubbabel, then Ezra, and then Nehemiah. And the book's design focuses on the efforts of each leader. Zerubbabel leads a large group of people back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Then about 60 years later, Ezra arrives in Jerusalem to teach the Torah and rebuild the community. And then he's followed by Nehemiah, who leads the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls. And these three stories are designed to be parallel. Each begins with the king of Persia prompted by God to send the leader to Jerusalem and he offers resources and support. And then each leader encounters opposition in their efforts, which they then overcome, but in a way that leads to a strange anticlimax in each of the three parts. Let's back up and see how it fits together. So the story begins with a decree from Cyrus, the king of Persia, and he's moved by God to allow the exiles to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And the author says this fulfills a promise made by the prophet Jeremiah that the exiles would one day return to Jerusalem. Now, this fulfillment should trigger our hopes in the many other prophetic promises that exile was not the end of the story. We have hope for a future messianic king from the line of David. We have hope for a rebuilt temple where God's presence will dwell with his people. Hope for God's kingdom to come over all the nations and bring his blessing, just like he promised to Abraham. And so it's with all these hopes in mind that we read on into the story of Zerubbabel. His name means planted in Babylon. He represents the generation born in Babylonian captivity, and he leads a wave of Israelites returning to Jerusalem. After they settle there, they rebuild the altar for offering sacrifices and later the temple itself. The foundation laying ceremony and then the temple's final dedication, these are key moments. The past stories of the tabernacle and temple's dedication should be in our minds. This is when the fiery cloud of God's presence is supposed to descend. He's dwelling with his people and it doesn't happen. And so while some people are happy about this new temple, the elders who had seen the previous temple of Solomon, they cry out in grief. It is nothing like their glorious past or their hopes for the future. And it's right here that we get the first story of opposition, and it's very odd. So the grandchildren of the Israelites who were not taken into exile, they had been living in Jerusalem all along, they come to offer help with the temple rebuilding. And Zerubbabel refuses. He says, you have no part in our temple. And this, of course, generates a conflict which Zerubbabel overcomes, but it's very strange because the prophets had envisioned that the tribes of Israel would all come together along with all of the nations to participate in the worship of the God of Israel when the kingdom finally comes. So this is an anticlimactic moment to say the least. In the next section, we zoom forward about 60 years and we're introduced to Ezra. He's a leader among the exiled Israelites in Babylon. And he's a Torah scholar and a teacher. And so he gets appointed by Artaxerxes, king of Persia, to lead another wave of people back to Jerusalem. And Ezra wants to bring about spiritual and social renewal among the people. Our hopes are high. And again, we come to another anticlimactic moment in the story. Ezra learns that many of the exiled Israelites that had come back, they had married non-exiles who had been living around Jerusalem. Some of them were non-Israelites and almost certainly some of them were. Ezra then appeals to the commands of the Torah that Israel was supposed to be holy and separate from the ancient Canaanites. And he then says that the people living around Jerusalem are like the Canaanites. They're going to corrupt the exiles. So Ezra offers a prayer of repentance and it's very heartfelt. But then he rallies all the leaders and enacts this divorce decree that says all these marriages should be annulled the women and children sent away. And then the decree is only partially carried out. We're given a list of some of the men who divorced their wives. The story is very strange for a number of reasons. First of all, God never commanded Ezra to do any of this. It was the leaders of Jerusalem who led Ezra to make the decree. Second, the contemporary prophet Malachi, he did say that the exile should care about purity, but he also said that God was opposed to divorce. And so the mixed results of the decree, this all fits into this pattern of a strange concluding anticlimax. 
which leads us to the next section about Nehemiah. He's an Israelite official serving in the Persian government, and when he hears about the ruined state of Jerusalem's walls, he prays and then gets permission from the Persian king Artaxerxes to go and rebuild the walls. The king even gives them an armed escort and all these resources. So after arriving in Jerusalem, he begins the building project, and he too faces opposition from the people who had already been living around Jerusalem. Once again, we face a tension in the story. The contemporary prophet Zechariah said that the new Jerusalem of God's kingdom would be a city without walls, that God's presence would surround it, that people from all nations would come and join the covenant people. But Nehemiah seems to operate with the opposite vision. He informs the people surrounding Jerusalem that they have no part in Jerusalem. And this, of course, provokes them to hostility. And so while Nehemiah carries out his vision for the city with integrity and courage. They have to build the city with armed guards to protect them. We keep wondering, could this whole conflict have been handled differently? And this all leads to the conclusion of the book in two movements, first positive and then negative. Ezra and Nehemiah combine forces to bring about a spiritual renewal among the people. They gather all the exiles together for a festival. They read and teach the Torah to all the people for seven days. And then they celebrate the ancient Feast of Tabernacles to remember God's faithfulness from the Exodus and the wilderness journeys. Then they offer a confession of their sins. They vow themselves to renew the covenant, follow all the commands of the Torah. And they finish with a great celebration over the temple, the walls of Jerusalem, and we're thinking, thinking this could be the turning point, but it's not. The book ends on a huge downer. Nehemiah tours around the city, and he finds that the people have not been fulfilling their covenant vows. So Zerubbabel's work is undone as he finds the temple being neglected and staffed by all these unqualified people. He then discovers that Ezra's work is being compromised. He finds everyone violating the Torah, people are working on the Sabbath, and even his own work on the walls is involved because people are setting up markets around the walls of Jerusalem and working on the Sabbath. So Nehemiah, he goes on a rampage. Page. He's beating people up, he's pulling out their hair, and he's yelling, obey the commands of the Torah. And his final words are a prayer that God would remember him, that at least he tried, and the book ends. I mean, it's very strange. But we've been prepared for it, right? These anticlimactic moments have been woven into the book's design intentionally. And so it raises the question, what on earth does this book contribute to the storyline of the Bible? Well, remember, the book started by raising our hopes in the prophetic promises about the Messiah, the temple, the kingdom of God, and then none of it happens. So even though Israel is now back in the land, their spiritual state seems unchanged from before the exile. And while Ezra and Nehemiah, they do their best, but their political and social reforms among the people don't address the core issues of their heart. So what the book is pointing out is the same need highlighted by the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel. What God's people need is a holistic transformation of their hearts if they're ever going to love and obey their God. And so the book ends on a downer, yes, but it forces you to keep reading on into the wisdom and prophetic books to find out what is God going to do to fulfill his great covenant promises. But for now, that's the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. Okay. Those guys are really good. You know, I just kind of watched that and I'm like, okay, well, I can't say it much better than that. Uh, let, let's try though. Let's, let's, let's dive in here to Nehemiah. Um, so let's, let's just start here at the beginning. It's closely, as you've seen, it's already, it's very closely associated to the ministry of Ezra. Okay, Ezra is a priest. He's bringing spiritual revival. Nehemiah is a governor, okay? And he's, he's appointed by, like he said, um, Artaxerxes. And in fact, when he, when he asks, he actually, he's, he's looking sad. And Artaxerxes is like, hey, what's the problem? Why are you looking sad? And, and um, uh, we'll get to that in just a second. But he, he sends him. And he goes, okay, you go. And he actually sends horses and, and soldiers with him and sends letters with him that, that gives him uh, supplies for what he's going to be doing. And so uh, he goes, and, and they've, they've, Ezra and Nehemiah are now this, this kind of this effective team, except that it does end somewhat anticlimactically. Um, 
what I, what I didn't realize until I started uh, studying this is that Nehemiah takes us all the way up to the end of uh, the Old Testament in, as far as chronologically. Um, so after he's gone, there's another 400 years before Messiah when there's no word from God. And, and I, was not, I wasn't putting that together in my mind until I started studying Nehemiah this past week that that brings us up chronologically to, to where pff, now there's that silent 400 years there. Um, like we said a minute ago, the, the events take place over a period of about 19 years, um, which is interesting because the first seven chapters in Nehemiah deal with the first 52 days of his ministry uh, to Jerusalem. So the last six are the next 18 plus years. Uh, but the first seven chapters deal with reconstructing the wall. Um, so this emphasis is on political and actual you know, physical construction and reconstruction. And in chapters 1 through 2, we see preparation for reconstructing the wall. And then in chapters 3 through 7, um, the actual reconstruction and what goes on to actually make that happen. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, this the walls of Jerusalem were destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 B.C. So we're talking 140, 150 years prior to this. The walls were destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And they've almost been rebuilt around 464 B.C. So that's around 20 years before this. Um, but then um, they were actually destroyed again. Uh, when Nehemiah is in the in the the court of the king Artaxerxes, and he, and he has some friends come to him, and this is in chapter 1, and he says, hey, how's Jerusalem doing? And what's going on? And, and they tell him, it's, it's not good, Nehemiah, it's not good. Well, he cries, and, he, and he fa it says that he fasts for several days, and he prays to God, and, uh, and that's when he comes to Artaxerxes, and Artaxerxes is like, hey, what's going on? Why are you looking so sad? You, I mean, and you know, I just can't, if you put yourself there, He's the cupbearer, right? And he, he's, he's kind of up there. I'm sure his pay was pretty good, and he's somebody in the, in the kingdom. And Artaxerxes is like, hey, listen, I don't want anybody around me that's going to have look like the long horse face, okay? I could grab anybody else that I trust to do this. And he's like, what's going on? And what I liked about that, and you, you, I just kind of glossed over it at first, but, but Nehemiah didn't just give him this sob story. He stopped, and he started praying to God right then. And, and we'll notice as we keep going that Nehemiah is a man of prayer, and he just, and he always, he hits these stumbling blocks and these, these roadblocks, and he stops and he prays. And so that's what he does. Um, and, and once he talks to Artaxerxes about it, then he does send him. Okay. So Nehemiah gets to Jerusalem, and he, and he gets together with the people, and he, and he challenges them, and, uh, and that's what we see in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse, verse 18. Yeah. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, this is the response from the people, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. And work begins immediately on the wall uh, with people building portions, which is, I thought was interesting, corresponding to where they're living in the city. So you've got this group over here, they live near the fish gate or whatever, and, and there's several gates that have strange names. One's like the mud gate, and one's the dung gate, you know. And, and so I don't think I'd want to live at dung gate, right? And, and so the guys, wherever they're living, that's where they start to rebuild the wall, okay? However, opposition quickly arises. Um, and I think that we all deal with this type of op opposition in our lives at some point or another, this first one. And it's from without. And is, have you guys ever heard of the, uh, I know you have, the crabs in the bucket um, picture or, or uh, analogy. That's the word I was looking for, analogy. Crabs in a bucket. Apparently, you can put one crab in a bucket and he'll get out. But if you like put two or three in, none of them will get out because one will start to climb out and the other one's grabbing. And so we've all been in that situation where you're trying to better yourself. You're trying to maybe, maybe you're trying to get a better job or you're, you're in a workplace and you're like, you're trying to move up. Everybody wants you to do good as long as they're, you're not doing better than them, right? That's kind of the crab in the bucket. And they run into some of these crabs, okay? One of them is Sanballat. One of them is Tobiah. 
and there were some others, but those are two of the main guys, the main characters that they run into. And uh, they're threatened, not only, not only uh, mocked and jeered, but they're threatened physically with physical violence. Okay, but if that's not enough, then they deal with opposition from the Jewish leadership because the Jewish leadership starts taking advantage of the, the Jews that are trying to rebuild the wall by taxing them unfairly. And so Nehemiah's got to deal with that. So the wealthier Jews are oppressing the, the poorer people, forcing them, in fact, to mortgage their property and sell their children into slavery just so they can pay the taxes. So while they're trying to rebuild the wall and focus, they're distracted now from within by their own leadership. Okay, but we see, though, that Nehemiah deals with the problem really well. He, he, uh, he goes at it, he attacks it from two different angles. He prays, so he's a man of prayer and he's a man of action. Okay, and we're also going to see that he's a man of dependence upon God, but also discipline to do things for, to, he, he's, he's not sitting around waiting. He's depending on God and he's praying, but he's disciplined to act. Um, and so he continues to trust in God and to press on with single-mindedness, okay, until the work is completed. And it is, like we said, in 52 days they finish it. Uh, and then, like you saw in verse 16, when all the enemies heard of it, they were afraid and they fell in their own esteem. And they, they had to say that this is from the help of God. Okay. So that's the first section, if you will, of Nehemiah, chapters 1 through 7. Chapters 8 through 13 deal with something totally different, all right? Because you guys are probably aware of this. It's easier to work on something physical, like, say, remodel a house, than to remodel what's inside, right? I know that for me. I've done several houses. We've remodeled several houses in the past, and, and that's challenging, but it's no, nothing like trying to uh, work on what's in here. <laughs> and I think Nehemiah found that as well, because... Uh, they made a lot of progress on the wall. They built the wall, completed it in 52 days, and now he turns inward and he says, oh, my soul, look what we have to deal with now. Now we have to reform ourselves morally. Okay, so the rest of the book deals with ref re reformation and restoration of the people. Uh, chapters 8 through 10 deal with renewal of a covenant, and then the rest of the book deals with obedience to that covenant. And as we've seen uh, in the, in, well, for the last how many ever years Dad's has preached here, God deals with his people through covenant, right? And so um, it's all about covenant and keeping covenant. And we've seen that when, when the covenant is kept, God blesses, right? And, but when, when his people break the covenant and they forget, which we see that they start to do again, um, then things go really, really bad. And so uh, there's, a, there's an emphasis on covenant here and obedience to the covenant. Uh, and, and the way they do that is that the, they come out into the, into the, I guess, like a, probably a big common area. And Ezra gets up on this big giant platform that, so he's above everybody so they can hear him, I suppose. And like uh, the, the video showed, does a marathon reading of the law. What I found interesting in the, hang on a second. I don't have the verses here. But it, it's interesting because he s says that he reads it in a way and explains it in a way that the people understand it. And I think that helps them because then they're like, oh, okay, okay. So the response then, now that they understand, is, oh, wow. Well, we, we're, we're in the wrong here. We need to renew our covenant with God. And so that's what happens, is that there's a, there's a reception of the word from Ezra. They receive it really well. And, they want it, and they're like, okay, yes, we need to renew our covenant with God. And um, I have about 100,000 pages of notes here. And so if I stumble for a little bit, that's, you guys are okay with that, I know. Um, because I'm kind of going back and forth uh, from extemporaneous speech, if you will, just from study, back to my notes. <laughs> and so that's where they're at in chapters 8 through, 13, um, 8 through 10 is this renewal of the covenant. Okay, uh, let's see here. I'm skipping a bunch of slides here, uh, Michelle, so just keep up with me. Okay, in Nehemiah 8, verse 8, okay, it says, They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, that's, this is what I was talking about, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. 
So not only did he read from it, he, he's, he's probably explaining along the way when he said, okay, this is what that means, all right? Um, and the people accept it. Uh, and so there is reform that comes. Now, I do want to get to this because, man, I don't see how dad gets through this stuff going so fast. This is crazy. Uh, but one of the main things I think we want to look at is wh- where do we find Christ in Nehemiah, right? Because that's the whole goal of this, this, this uh, overview of the Bible is to find, where do we find Jesus Christ? And Nehemiah de- portrays Christ uh, in several ways, okay? Uh, and first of all, he portrays Christ in his ministry of restoration because he's restoring Jerusalem, okay? Uh, first of all, in the wall and then morally. So he's re- Christ brings restoration in that he, brings, he restores our relationship with God. Nehemiah illustrates Christ in that he uh, gives up a high position. We've already talked about what he was in the court of Artaxerxes, but he gave that up to go and identify with his people. And he comes with a specific mission. And if we know anything about Jesus Christ, he was laser focused on the mission his entire life. He knew where he was going and nothing was going to stop him. And he fulfills it. And his life is characterized by prayerful dependence upon God. And, you know, Jesus, when he was here on earth, was still fully God and fully man, right? Okay, somehow. And yet we see in his life a life of prayer. And dependence upon God. And that's what we see in Nehemiah. Um, in this book, uh, everything is restored except the king. Okay, so the temple's rebuilt. Jerusalem is reconstructed. Covenant is renewed between the, the, uh, the Jerusalem people and God. And the people are reformed. Okay. Whew. So, and, no, I don't, I want to skip. I want to skip that. Okay. I've got some notes here about Daniel's prophecy, and I'm going to skip that if that's okay, because that gets a little heavy for me and and deep. And uh, but what's happening here basically is that some of the stuff that happens here with Nehemiah fulfills part of Daniel's prophecy, and 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 uh, I don't want to go into exactly what what all that is, but it does. And you can look in Daniel chapter 9, uh, verses 25 through 27, as a reference to what's happening here. Now, um, let's see. We are moving here. Okay, I want to light on something for just a minute, because um, one of the ways that I feel like Nehemiah models Jesus Christ for us about more than anything else is his prayer life. Um, and let's look at a few, a few verses from Nehemiah. Michelle, uh, one of them is chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. And this is where Nehemiah has talked with his friends. He's still in the court of Artaxerxes. He's still living there. And he's talked with his friends, and he's heard the bad report. And in these verses 5 through 11, he goes into an intense prayer to God, Okay. Um, first of all, he acknowledges who God is, your great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love who, with him, and, uh, who love him and keep his commandments. Um, and, he, and he asks him, keep your, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant. That's Nehemiah. Okay, and then he, and then he, uh, he repents for the people. We've acted very corruptly in verse 7 against you and have not kept your commandments. Verse 8, remember the word that you commanded uh, your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I'll scatter you among the peoples. But, that's that's a great but right there, if you return to me, keep my commandments and do them, uh, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. Okay, so he's praying to God, and he says in verse 11, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now, I was the cupbearer to the king. That's the end of chapter 1. So he's praying to God when he hears this. Now he goes to the king. uh, Artaxerxes sees that he is sad. Um... And he says, why is your face sad in verse 2 of chapter 2? 
seeing you're not sick. This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Uh, and he says, let the king live forever. Um, so he says, what are you requesting? In verse 4, the king said to me, what are you requesting? He says, so I prayed to the God of heaven. And you can imagine, I know that those, those kings back then, they were no nonsense. And if you messed around in the time of Joseph even, right? I mean, he would throw them into prison just like that. Have them executed just like that. And so there's probably some fear and trembling uh, that came at that moment. And so there's some prayer that happens. Um, but once he explains it to him, then he sends him with his blessing. And then we see again in chapter 2 of Nehemiah, verses 19 through 20. This is when Sanballat and Tobiah enter the scene. Uh, and then Geshem, that was the one I couldn't remember. Um, he, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you're doing, rebelling against the king? And he replied to them very strongly, the God of heaven will make us prosper. And we, his servants, will arise and build, but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. So he wasn't afraid to stand up for what he believed in. In Nehemiah chapter 4, again, Sanballat, this guy is just no good. You, you guys ever met people like this? I mean, I can just see these guys. They walk into the room, and this is the kind of guy that you see him coming, and you just want to uppercut him, you know? I mean, you just know he's coming, and you're like, no, he's no good. He's up to no good. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. I mean, I just what I imagine when this guy comes in, and he's like swaggering in, and he's like, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just jeer at these guys and cause a lot of trouble. Um. That was just my own personal take on it. <laughs> that, wasn't, that wasn't biblical uh, <laughs> exposition right there. But he said in the, let's say, so this is Sam Ballot here, and he said in the presence of his brothers and the army of Samaria. So he's got the ear of the army of Samaria somehow. What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Well, it wasn't quite a day, but it was 52, so that wasn't too bad. Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burn ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him. I can imagine this little fella. He's probably like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, he jumps in. It's like, ha. Huh. Okay, he's probably the, like the little scrawny one that's, that wanted to get his word in. Yeah. What they're building, if a fox goes up on the, it will break down their stone wall. So they're just making fun of him. And then uh, this is, this is uh, Nehemiah. Hear, O oh our God, for we are despised. So he, he, what does he do? I, me, I, I kind of know what I would do in that situation. You know, and it, it would n probably not be good. Uh, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be uh, redemptive. But Nehemiah, he stops and he thinks and he prays. Hear, O oh God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. And this is pretty strong. Do not cover their guilt, it says in, in verse 5 there of chapter 4. And let not their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. So he, he's, he's, uh, he's uh, talking to God and saying, God, this is not about what they're doing to me. This is about what they're doing to you in your name. Um, I thought that was interesting. He's praying and, and he's showing how they're against God. So then we built the wall, verse 6, and all the wall was joined together to half its height for the people had a mind to work. Okay, and then again, Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 7 to 10, these guys are added again. Um, they heard that they were repairing the wall still, that, that their jeering had not done its work, it hadn't done the trick, so they got very angry, it says, and they plotted together to come and now fight physically fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. And uh, Nehemiah says, we prayed to our God. Again, he's a man of prayer. He, it's, that's his first reaction is to pray and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. In Judah, it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. Okay, so he stops and he prays. Verses 11 through 14, the same chapter. The enemy said, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. So now they have a plot to go and kill them. Um, so let's see here. So 
We saw, I talked a little bit earlier, just mentioned that he was also a man of action. Prayer and action, right? So what does he do? In, the, in verse 13, it says, In the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in open places, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. So they're making preparation. Okay, these guys aren't wimps. They're not going to just take a beating. I am sorry. This thing is about to fall off my goofy ear. I have misshapen ears, if you guys don't know that. I'm just going to go ahead and admit to that. Okay. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When I read that a couple of times, the second time, it was like, that dude's like Braveheart. Okay? Can you imagine? He's like, he's given a rousing... Uh, arousing talk here and and basically he's uh he's admonishing them and 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 giving them motivation to to, to be strong and, and to fight for their for their country uh nehemiah chapter 6 verse 9 says they all wanted to frighten us thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done what does he do he prays but now O god strengthen my hands And then in uh, chapter 6, verse 14, it says, remember, he's, now he's praying um, to God about these guys. Tobiah, remember Tobiah and Sanballat, oh my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess Noadiah, and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. So he's asking God to remember. Um, now, there's, there's a lot more here. But man. Time just fast forwards when you try to teach stuff. Um, one of the things that we kind of skipped over, and I just want to mention it real quick, is one of the plots that they had was they sent some messengers and they and they they told Nehemiah they said, "Hey, Tobiah, and these guys want to meet with you, just to talk things over." And uh, and Nehemiah. It says that he, that he understood from God that they were trying to trick him. And instead of, instead of go to meet, him, meet them, he said, no, I've, I've got too much work here to do. And so they, they do try it two or three times to, to trick him, to get them to meet him, so that, obviously so they could murder him. But uh, Nehemiah cannot be distracted. And, God, and, and it says that God kind of gave him that understanding that, hey, this is a trick, this is a trap. Um, and so they finish the wall, and uh, in like we've talked about a little bit in verses eight, in chapters eight through ten, they renew their covenant with God. Now, at some point, though, Nehemiah returns to Persia to Artaxerxes. Um, he's, he goes back, and then there's an amount of time that goes by, and things uh, things don't go super awesome. Because when he when he uh, he gets he has he has to go back. He's like I got to go back to Jerusalem, and when he gets back, the video kind of kind of uh, showed some of the stuff that was going on. Um, but what's happening is in chapter thirteen. Let's just look at chapter thirteen because uh, I don't think I've got that in the slides, Michelle. But let's look at chapter thirteen because. Um, he comes back, and uh, what's going on is there's just some, the temple is not being used correctly. They've set up this, one of the chambers for Tobiah, who, as we know, is one of the bad guys in this story, and it's not being used correctly. And so, uh, <laughs> in verse 8 of chapter 13, it says, I was, is Nehemiah, and I was very angry. And I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. Okay, so he's literally, physically throwing furniture out of the, the temple here. Then I gave orders, and they cleansed the chambers, and I brought back there the vessels of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. So he's setting it back up the way it's supposed to be. <clears throat> and then verse 10, I also found out that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them, so that the Levites and the singers who did the work had fled each to his field. So they're going back to work because they're like, we've got to eat. 
So I confronted the officials and said, why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their stations. Okay, then all Judah brought, the, this is verse 12, all Judah brought the tithe of the grain, wine, and oil into the storehouses. And I appointed as treasurers, he appoints some treasurers over the storehouses, okay, to take care of that. And he says, the guys that he appointed, he, he did that because they were considered reliable. And their duty was to distribute, make the distributions. Okay, and then he's praying again. Remember me, O my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I've done for the house of my God and for his service. So even in verse uh, 14 right there, he's, he's already praying to God, please, God, remember that I tried. That's kind of like what the video was saying a minute ago. At least remember what I've tried to do here. Uh, and then, then he addresses that the people of, of Judah are breaking the Sabbath. And so now they're, they're he said they're tre- in verse 15, they're treading wine presses. And you guys know what that means, right? They're, they're the big vats with the grapes. They're, walk- they're running around in those and, and pressing the wine on the Sabbath. And also bringing in harvesting grain and loading them on donkeys and also wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of loads which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. This was strictly forbidden, according to the law, in the covenant that they had just renewed. And so he warned them, it says in uh, in that same verse 15, I warned them on the day when they sold food. Tyrians also, this is verse 16, who lived in the city, brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the people of Judah in Jerusalem itself. And I confronted the nobles of Judah again and said to them, What is this evil thing that you are doing, profaning the Sabbath day? Do not your fathers act, did, did not your fathers act in this way? And did not our God bring all this disaster on us, on this city? He's like, it's like, he's going, hello. You know, this is, we're repeating. You know, we're just repeating what our fathers did. And now you're bringing more wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. And so what does he do? He's a man of action. Again, he's like, no, nah, I'm not going to take it. As soon as it began to grow dark, this is verse 19, at the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I commanded that the doors should be shut and gave orders that they should not be opened until after the Sabbath. So if you imagine this, the evening before the Sabbath, shut the doors, the gates, and wait till after the Sabbath to open them. And uh, I stationed some of my servants at the gates that no load might be brought in on the Sabbath day. So he is basically physically keeping them from breaking the Sabbath at this point. Um, He's like, all right, if you guys aren't going to take my teaching, then we're just going to stop it altogether. Uh, Then the merchants and the sellers, this is verse 20, of all kinds of wares lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. But I warned them and said to them, why do you lodge outside the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. All right, so there's this dude is, he is no joke. All right, he is not a wuss when it comes to getting things done. From that time on, they did not come on the Sabbath. So I imagine that um, Mr. Nehemiah, he was a man of prayer, he was a man of action, but he was not a uh, man to be trifled with. And he, he was probably a pretty strong fellow, at least had a commanding presence about him. Uh, verse 22, Then I commanded the Levites that they should purify themselves and come and guard the gates to keep the Sabbath day holy. So he spends a lot of effort here making sure that the Sabbath is kept. Okay? And then towards the end, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I skipped right past it. Right here at the end, he's ta- and then he's dealing with them marrying uh, other, the women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. That's verse 23. This is interesting. It says, this is verse 24. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod, and they could not speak the language of Judah, but only the language of each people. And I confronted them and cursed them and beat some of them and pulled out their hair. Um, you've got to imagine that at some point he just got fed up. You know, he's just tired. And I I made them take an oath in the name of God, saying, You shall not give your daughters to their sons, or take their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. And he mentions again, Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin on account of such women? 
Uh, among the many nations, there was no king like him, and he was beloved by his God. And God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, foreign women made even him to sin. So one of the greatest of men was brought down by this, this intermarrying that was not supposed to happen. All right, so we get down here to the bottom. Verse 30 says, Thus I cleansed them from everything foreign, and I established the duties of the priests and Levites, each in his work, and I provided for the wood offering at appointed times and for the first fruits. Remember me, O oh my God, for good. So, like the video showed us and, and said, um, the, the end of this book comes and all this work has been done and it is somewhat anticlimactic because it doesn't seem that their hearts have been cleansed. There's been a lot of moral reform that's gone on and construction a restoration, but the heart of the people is, is not cleansed. And I think that we're, we really need to see that and, and see that God meant it for that. Because I think throughout history, we're supposed to finally see, and I, and I think Jerusalem was supposed to see that they needed a Savior, they needed a Messiah. And, uh, and that the, the only true restoration, permanent restoration that was going to come was when Messiah came. So we see in Nehemiah, Jesus Christ, because uh, he gave up a high position so that he could be with his people. Um, We'd, I didn't mention it in my notes here, but, but uh, when he was there, he gave up his governor's salary that he was supposed to receive because he was governor of Jerusalem during that time. But he gave up that salary. So, and he gave up some of the other benefits that came with that to show that, hey, I'm serious. I'm not going to be taking from you. We're, I'm going to be giving to you and giving to the people. Um, and he was a man on a mission. He was laser-focused. Uh, and while he was focused on the wall, that's what they did. When he was focused on reform, that's what he was focused on. Uh, and he couldn't be dissuaded. He couldn't be distracted. He couldn't be tricked. Uh, and, he, and he was a man that was a man of prayer, a man of action, a man of discipline, uh, and a man of dependence upon God, just like our Savior. Um, that's all I have. I went longer than I thought I was going to go. I told my wife, this is going to be like a mini many teaching time, but man, getting through a whole book is, is something else. Uh, Barry, you need to try it. I want, I want, I'm going to tell Dad you need to get assigned to do this. <laughs> but uh, that's Nehemiah in a few minutes, and um, do you guys have any observations 